Okay, we are going to start with our mandated reporter training and I am going to turn it over to Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie Chapman and I'm just going to make a disclosure at the beginning. I haven't done a video conference before, so this is going to be a learning experience and I keep getting kicked off. So if I'm there and then I'm not there, give me just a couple minutes. <laughs> It'll all work out. It will, we'll figure it out. Okay, so at the end of this session, you should be able to define what child maltreatment is, define the role of the mandated reporter. And as we go along, if you have questions, I would rather you stop me right then and ask rather than wait to the end or wait to a question part. That way I know what I'm talking about right there and I don't, I don't have to try to remember what topic I was on. Um, so feel free to ask me anything. Um, I'm a juvenile officer and I've done this for almost 14 years. So that's where my experience comes from mostly. Okay, um, child abuse and neglect, it impacts all of our communities. It is a community problem which requires community solutions. And oftentimes, especially in um, the more poverty-stricken counties, it goes undetected and unreported. The acts of commission, something committed, done equals abuse. Acts of omission, not done equals neglect. Okay. We're gonna talk about um, four different types of ab abuse today. I will elaborate on, on probably three of those more than the other two. There is a, actually a fifth type that, it, that you will see on the right-hand side, the educational neglect, um, and it is mo the most unreported neglect that we have. Um, we have um, neglect, we have emotional abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And as you can see, um, I pulled the stats from the Missouri Children's Division or what a lot of people Still refer to them as DFS um, from their annual report from last year. So as you can see, um, the neglect is the most reported. Sometimes medical neglect is also included in that neglect. It actually just kind of depends on how the report is received and coded out. In the state of Missouri last year, there was 5,600 um, children included in those reports. About 88% of all cases, the perpetrator or the offender, I will use those words interchangeably today, is known to the victim. Whether it's a family friend, a babysitter, an older friend of the child, and 30% of the 88% are usually a relative or family member. The greatest offender that is reported is the white male. And as you will see in a later slide that or I will talk about it, kids don't often report this, and this is the main reason, is because they don't report that they're being abused because it's a family member, and one, they won't either, either be believed or it will be kept secret and the abuse will continue. They think they will be punished or things like that. Abuse, these definitions were actually just updated. Abuse is any physical injury, sexual abuse, or emotional abuse inflicted on a child other than by accidental means, by those responsible for the child's care, custody, and control. Um, I get asked a lot, well, can I spank my child? Yes, you can spank your child as long as it's administered in a reasonable manner. And that, that means you can't leave marks, you can't leave bruises, or cause pain that lasts you know, any length of time. But yes, spanking is still allowed, as long as, like, like I said, it's done in a reasonable manner. When a lot of people think about abuse, we think about an adult abusing a child, but don't forget that a juvenile can abuse another juvenile. And those are also reported and are just as important. So it will be juvenile on juvenile, not necessarily adult on juvenile or child. Um, emotional abuse, that is oftentimes is the hardest cases we have to prove because it, it's, it's very hard. We have to bring in experts. There has to be a lot of testing done on the child. 
we have to prove that there's injury to the child's psychological capacity or he's emotionally unstable. So a lot of times that is combined into the physical abuse or the sexual abuse, but obviously there's emotional abuse goes along with those two as well. I didn't include physical injury. The definition um, by statute for physical injury, it includes any bruising, lacerations, hematomas, whelps, permanent or temporary disfigurement, loss or impairment of any bodily function or organ, which may be accompanied by physical pain, illness, or impairment of the child's physical condition. So that's what we have to look at a lot of times when we're looking at physical abuse. We also have to turn to that and see what physical injury um, was occurred during that time. Okay, recognizing signs of abuse. There's been several studies done and there's some things that are pretty obvious that are signs of abuse. Some of the things aren't so obvious or they may look like abuse, but they're really not. The bruising on this child on the left-hand side wouldn't necessarily be from physical abuse. Some of these bruising on the shins and the knees are normal child bruising. Um, my son, he's very rough, he's seven, and he has bruises on his legs 90% of the time. So just because a child has bruises, you can't automatically think that they are being abused. However, the bruising on the right of the child, on the, on the child on the right, if there's bruising in those areas, we need to be questioning and we need to be looking into that and doing some investigation. If you've got bruising on the face, you've got black eyes, you've got busted lips, you've got hand marks. Um, the ears are something that a lot of people don't realize. And I've had several cases where the child's ears are bruised. Your ears are made of mostly ligament and they are some of the hardest places on your body to bruise. So if a child has bruises on their ears, there's more than likely some abuse occurring. If there's bruising on the belly, the genital area, um, on the back, then depending on, you need to look for like bite marks. I've had a child that had, she was four and 90% of her body was covered in bite marks and bruises. And a human bite mark is obviously different than an animal bite mark. And this little girl, head to toe, I mean, she had bite marks all over her body from her mother. Bruising in the genital area, unless they've had a major trauma, you know, that's usually a for sure sign. You've got handprints, you've got belt mark. We had a child that was one time that he was hit with a belt and the belt buckle on that belt, the imprint, the H, um, was actually on that child's forehead. We had a kid that this top of his foot was all bruised because the, the child's foot had been stomped. So the bruising, pay attention to a child's bruising, pay attention to where they are. I know that you all work a lot with the um, teens. So something I'm gonna throw out there, it's not really included in this slide, but I just a little bit more information. And we are seeing a lot of teenagers now that cut or use erasers for burn marks. So look for um, cut marks on their wrist, on their upper thighs, Sometimes they'll do it on their upper arms and their armpits, and those need to be hotlined as well because they're doing self-harm. Some of the other signs and symptoms of physical abuse, like I've talked about, they have unexplained injuries, burns, bite, bruises, broken bones, or black eyes. They may have bruising at different stages, and so that's something that needs to be reported if you see a child and they, ha they have multiple bruises and they're multiple colors, then that needs to be reported. When we, when we get to the part about the mandated reporting, that will make more sense, but make sure you report that. They've got bruising in different stages. So it, this isn't an isolated event that this child has came to your activity with bruising. Scars, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're withdrawn, or they're aggressive. They're frightened of their parents or their caregiver. Um, they shrink at the approach of adults. Um, their eating habits and their sleeping habits change. And they will abuse animals or pets. Some other things to look for is they will show a sudden change in their behavior at home and at school and their school performance will go down, their grades will go down. 
Um, they may not play with the same kids at recess that they've always played with before. They won't have, they'll have trouble concentrating. They won't interact. They'll be really withdrawn a lot of times. And then other times they're completely the opposite. Um, they're trying to get any attention they can get. They're the class clown. They're just in your face. They won't calm down. So we really have to watch the child's behaviors and talk to the school counselor or whatever to see what is his norm. Okay, sexual abuse. Men are the nine is um, men make up about 94% of the offenders. That's so about 6% are female. Men abuse both male and female children. 75% of male offenders are married or have a consist consenting sexual relationship. And 4% of same-sex abuse involves homosexual perpetrators. But I, we do see, um, I, we, I work down and carry a caseload in Oregon County. So that's like Alton, Sayre in that area. But my circuit where I work, encompasses four counties, um, two of the more poverty-stricken counties in the state, um, and we see sexual, a lot of sexual abuse cases come through my office. You can change it. Okay, you did. Um, about one in four females under the age of 18 and one in six of children under the age of 18 will be victimized in some way. Now, when we think about sexual abuse, a lot of times we think, well, that's just sex. No, that number includes fondling, touching, so it doesn't just mean that they've been penetrated. Um, incest is estimated to occur in about 14% of all families, and as you can see at the bottom, no race, social, or economic class is immune to family sexual abuse. And 25% of, of American children are incest victims. And incest, that could be brothers, um, dads, grandpas, uncles, cousins, I mean, any, any of those, those where those stats are pulled from. Um, on the sexual abuse, some of the same, you're gonna see some of the same signs and symptoms of sexual abuse that you will see for physical abuse. Um, however, um, there are some different ones too. Um, some of the mo more common ones, um, they will have difficulty walking or sitting they will have bleeding, bruising, or swelling in their private parts. Um, they will refuse to go to school. They, um, if a child has been potty trained and if they're being sexually abused, a lot of times they will go back to wetting the bed. They will go back to wetting their pants and having accidents. Again, they will have a change in their appetite. Um, some of their behaviors will just be bizarre and they will be more sexualized than most children their age. They may even touch other children inappropriately um, because they think that's the norm. So to them, to them that, that's the norm. That's what's done in their house. That's what's done to them. So why isn't it okay for me to touch my friend in the private area? And we are seeing, and again, don't focus on just the adults that may be perp perping on this child. It could be another sibling, it could be a cousin, it could be a younger, a younger child than them or an older child of them. And it's any sexual activity, um, it's not just intercourse. It could be oral, it can be just them touching them inappropriately. Um, so it can be them being exposed to pornography. They sometimes parents make them watch, sit and watch, pornography with them. I mean, so all of that is combined in the sexual abuse definition. And the sex trafficking is really falls into this definition as well. And we are seeing more and more cases of that, um, not so much in our area, but I know in other states, they're seeing, seeing that more and more. So they're trying to encompass the sex trafficking in some of our statues and things like that. Okay, any questions or comments or anything up until this point? Okay, should you hotline? Okay, and who is a mandated reporter? Okay, 
does somebody have a question? Because my chat little thing is lit up. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. According to the Missouri Statute 210.115.1, it is basically anybody that comes into contact in a professional capacity um, with a child. And if you don't report, I mean, I'm not going to read the whole um, definition or statute because it's on the slide. But it is basically anybody that comes into contact anymore with a child is a mandated reporter. Natalie, may I interrupt and just for a second? Sure. There is a there is a question of how someone would recognize sex trafficking is going on. Okay, and I'm I will say that I will have to do some more research on that because I did not include that in this slide because. That is something they are just starting to train us on. Um, so I don't care to look into that and send that information out. Let me make it myself a note and I will do that. Um, something else that I will include in the sexual abuse is a lot of times we are seeing some, some of, a lot of times in our drug abuse cases, drug cases, we are seeing kids prostituted out for drugs. I mean, they will, let me have a turn at your daughter and I'll give you meth. Or they all get and have a big drug party and the parents just let whoever have access to their children. So we are seeing a lot of, a lot of that in our area and I'm sure it's in everybody's area right now. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind as well. Is there another question or is that just her? Is that Kathy's? Just a thank you. Okay, all right, sounds good. Okay, any question about the definition? I mean, we're basically all mandated reporters and if we don't report it, um, we can be held accountable. Again, I will stress in this, it says any person responsible for the child's care, custody and control um, uh, we are seeing more and more children being raised by grandparents, aunt and uncles, cousins, because either parents are not in the picture or they're um, because they're deceased, they're in prison, they don't want their children. So it doesn't have to be a parent. It can be their caregiver. It can, it, it's whoever is responsible for that child. And at school, it can be a teacher. I mean, there's a lot of people that have care custody control of that child throughout the, throughout the day. So just don't get hung up on it's the person that they reside with. If you fail to report, you can be charged with a class A misdemeanor. Um, and I know some cases where they have actually been prosecuted and they have been found guilty of that for not reporting. Um, that's why some of our statutes have changed with regards to this because in the school systems and in daycare, it used to be where if a teacher or child care provider needed to make a hotline, they went to the director, they went to the school counselor, and they reported their concerns, and then that person was responsible for hotlining. Well, there was a case that, a couple cases, that that was not done, and that child, one of them ended up dying. And then the other one was continued to be abused because it wasn't it wasn't re reported and investigated. So now it's whoever knows about that abuse is responsible for making that hotline. Now you can still tell your supervisor, you can still tell, you know, at schools, you can still tell the counselor, whoever you need to tell your superiors, but it is on you to make that hotline. Natalie, um, do, Natalie can I interject a second? Yes. Eric, you may want to comment too. When it comes to our volunteers, they may come to us as 4-H um, staff members, faculty members and say, hey, you know, I've been told this or I've seen this or I'm thinking this and want us to report, but it's actually them that needs to make the report. Now we can be present and sitting there for emotional support of the volunteer, but it's the volunteer that has to make the report. Correct, correct. 
Um, so a couple of things there. If if a volunteer is just kind of thinking, I'm not sure if I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I mean, that that's fine to ask somebody else, a staff member, and, um, uh, you know, another certified adult to come see and see if they come to kind of the same conclusion. But yes, if they are pretty sure if they have all the signs and signals, then they are the ones that need to make the call. But Eric, this is Kathy. Um, mm -hmm. Once we know, aren't we responsible as well? Even if it's not, even if it's unfounded, once we are aware, I mean, that's the way I understand it, that we are responsible for reporting what we've heard. And yes, and my solution to that would be, Kathy, that you boast it in there, and then they will say, has anybody else know about the abuse? And you can give both of your names that you're sitting there. That way you're both covered. Okay. Because when I call in hotlines, which I call in hotlines almost weekly, um, they will ask me who else knows about this and or online, which I don't get to. Um, and you have to put down all other agencies. And a lot of times the sheriff's departments that I'm working with also know about it. And so I will put that they know about it and you know, myself and whoever else, the school or whoever. And it doesn't hurt to hotline something twice. If they get the same hotline come in twice, they duplicate it out. So, and in my opinion, I'd rather something be reported twice than not at all. Any, any other questions or thoughts on that? None seen. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, when a child discloses to you, so prior to you making the hotline and when the child discloses something to you, um, you need to remain calm. Um, you need to be aware of your body language and facial expressions, um, which sometimes is really hard for me because everything I'm thinking sh usually shows all over my face. Um, so, and you need to avoid over questioning. Let them talk. Let the child tell you what they have to tell you because a lot of times they will tell you more then you stand in there asking them questions. And a lot of times, if you keep asking and pushing, they're gonna shut down on you. And then, then you're not gonna have anything. Then you're not going, you have nothing to report. So let them talk to you. Just, just let them talk. And, and if you do have questions, ask. Um, and, and clarify who they're talking about. Um, because I have a case that everybody in the family was involved in. So I ended up having to make a family tree to figure out, okay, these kids are actually belong to these parents, but they live with the grandparent and the other grandparent has visitation rights. So you need to make sure that you know the genealogy of that family and who is who and who they're actually talking about. Because we have some cases where they say someone is their dad who biologically is their grandpa. So when you're calling in the hotline, you can say, they're saying dad, but I believe that to be their biological grandpa. Um, don't discount or minimize what a child says to you. You may know this family because you've worked with them for years and you may not think that they're capable of that father cannot be sexually abusing his daughter. Well, they probably are. So don't minimize it, say, oh, that can't happen or let's just keep that a secret, we won't tell. Um, and don't discount, don't discount. Even if you think in the back of your mind, that really can't be happening, that's the most crazy thing I've ever heard. Believe me, I've done this 14 years, I've seen a lot and I've heard a lot, and there's still times I'm like, are you kidding me? That really happens. It does really happen. Children don't always use proper names for body parts. We try to raise our children as calling them proper body parts. My this is the one hotline that I will re always remember. This little girl was being sexually abused by, it was either her grandpa or her dad, and I can't remember which one, but she reported it multiple times. But the first person she reported it to said, my grandpa is touching my cookie. Okay. For me, I'd be like, what? Because I, I do this day in and day out. But for the people that don't deal with this stuff, sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, I, my caseload is foster kids. So for the people that don't deal with that, 
you probably would think, okay, whatever, and go on. She was talking about her vagina. Her grandpa <clears throat> had been sexually abusing her for years, and he was touching her vagina, her cookie. That's what she called it. Um, and so when they're talking to you, they will, they may say really weird things. Um, so that you may have to ask for clarification. You need to document and provide written documentation only to who needs it and put it in the child's file. I, I use some of the same information for the Boys and Girls Club when I do their manda mandated reporter training. And so when they make a report, they have to write, the teacher or the staff member has to write it up um, and then they put it in the child's file. I don't know how you all do that or if you even have files, but you still need to document it and you need to keep a copy of it or your volunteers need to keep a copy of it and then give it to a specialist or whoever is in charge of those volunteers. Is that what you, is that your all's policy or do you have one? Eric, would it be that we keep a copy um here in the office and then we send a copy to you we send it to the 4-h office what would that merit definitely keeping a copy in the in the office uh in, in kind of the same loft way you would keep any other uh, secure documents as far as who at the state office you know if it's involving uh, a youth and send it, go ahead and send it to me. And I'll, I'll, you know, if it involves a volunteer, I'll keep it. If it's more of a, a parent and a youth thing, I'll, I'll get it to who needs a copy of it. But yeah, I can be the, the person at the state office to receive those. Okay. Is this going to apply for those of us that work with master gardeners? Um, just send things to you? It sure can, uh, definitely, you know, if, if they're dealing with the public and, uh, you know, it's an adult program, but the adult brings a child with them and, you know, right. signs and symptoms, definitely report it, uh, you know, keep the copy there and send it to me and I'll, I'll figure out who needs, if it's me, I'll keep it. If it's somebody else, um, then, then I'll get it to the right person. Um, when I make it a hotline, I have my notes in front of me, which this is on, I think, on two, two more, three more slides down, but um, just make sure that you keep a copy of that um, because you may get a phone call from the children's division from that worker wanting to see, because sometimes not all the information is entered on the hotline, so they may just call and clarify some things with you. Also, just remain professional. Um, you may be the one person that that child feels safe with and that will protect them. And, you know, just be that person, remain professional. Um, if you need to talk to somebody about what's going on, if you think they're being abused, but you're really not sure, absolutely talk to somebody. Um, but this, this part to me is one of the, the more important um, slides when a child discloses. Um, there are people that are trained that once a child discloses and we need more information, um, the CAC, we send a lot of our kids to the CAC and those forensic interviewers are amazing. And so they will get the, get more details and elaborate on some of the things that are being reported. But the more, the more documentation you can get when, before you make the hotline, the better. Gives us more to work with. Okay, here's the hotline number. Um, that 1-800 number um, is the main number. That's the same number we've always had. However, you will sit on there forever. Um, so they have made an online reporting um, website available now. I don't know if any of you have used it. Um, when you first go to use that, it can be very time consuming because it's just an odd form, I think. Um, but after you've done it a time or two, it goes pretty quickly. Um, you cannot use it if you believe the child to be in imminent danger. So when you first open it, sign in and open it up, there will be a list of questions. And if you answer any of them, yes, it will make you call it in. Um, but it is very handy. I use that 
probably more than I call in hotlines anymore because we would be sitting on the phone an hour, hour and a half sometimes just trying to call in a hotline. Hi, Natalie. This is Beth. I put it in the chat. Okay, great. I was having trouble the other day getting it to open. Um, so if somebody has a problem, I my email address is on the last slide. Just email me and I can send it directly to you. Um, you can call law enforcement, your local law enforcement agency, your local juvenile office, and or you can call your local Missouri Children's Division office. However, you still have to call on a hotline. Even though you call us and say, Sally is being, um, her dad is having sex with her, and you tell me that, um, you still have to call on a hotline. That doesn't take the place of it. Um, making a report. So it is so much easier on you and on the, um, the person taking the report on the other end of the phone, if you have all this information already gathered and um, have that in front of you when you're making a report. Um, and I don't know if, if you have a form that you can take, type up and it can just be in your forms manual or whatever. Um, some of the, like Ozark Action, they have a nice little packet that they give all of their staff that has all this information. So they fill this out and then they have it with them when they make the call. Um, you need the child's full name, the date of birth and or the age. A lot of, sometimes you may not know the date of birth, but if you've got an approximate age, um, their gender, their race, and which school, this is something that they have started asking, which school or daycare they attend, um, parents or caregivers full name. So if they reside with their grandparents and if you have the parents information at, you'll see that I put parent not residing in the home. So the more information uh, that you have, the better. Um, obviously their address, um, the telephone number of the parent, other children living in the home, um, and then the nature of injury abuse, um, and be specific and give details. Um, you also, as a mandated reporter, we cannot remain anonymous. So you have to give your name, your occupation, your place of employment, your address and telephone number. I've called in and then once you call in and they say, and you say your name, they, they will say, what is your job title? I tell them deputy juvenile officer. They'll say to me, do you still work at 111 Walnut Street? Yes. Is your phone number still? And I say, yes. So once, once you've called in one, your information is saved in their system. So you don't have to give that to them every time. Um, we have to give our name so we can't be, we can't remain anonymous. However, your information should not be given out. So children's vision goes out and the parents say, well, I want to know who called in that hotline. Was it so-and-so? Well, I'm sorry, but I can't give you that information is what they say. Even when they send us hotlines, a lot of times they will black out the reporter because that information should not be given out. If it is given out, I believe that is grounds for termination through Children's Division's policy. Um, because as mandated reporters, they, we should be protected. And I mean, I've had, for those that don't know, Belinda is my mother, but um, so when I say this, she's, she's not going to be shocked, but I've had multiple threats made upon me because of what I do. And um, so saying that, being a mandated reporter, if our information is given out, you know, that just puts us in danger. What if we don't have some of this information when we need to make the call? Do, what do we say? Or do we need to take the time to research it and find it? Like what well, if, what if, if we don't have an address or something? Um, if you know the town they live in. Okay. If you know, like I said, on the age, on the online reporting, if you don't know their date of birth, it tells you like an age range because a lot of times you're not for the child, but also does that for the parents. So if you don't know their specific age, um, you, there's an age range you can click. And it's the same thing for the address. You may not know their actual physical address, but more than likely you're gonna know what town they reside in. Right, would that be correct? Right. 
Right, we should. And most of the time we should have their, for the 4-H people, we should have the majority of the information. But the Master Gardener people or some of the other volunteers might not. Well, would that be a case where they could come to you all as specialists that those, um, that you would have that information and they could sit down with you and you could help them make the hotline or provide that information to them? Possibly so. It, it would just, I think, depend on who the child is and maybe the event that they had been at. Um, but yes, that would be an option. Because they do that at Boys and Girls Club. The staff, the teachers, the staff that actually works in the rooms one-on-one -on -one or with the children, they obviously don't have the file. So they go to their supervisor, office staff, and look at the file and they sit there with them so they have all the demographics right as they make that hotline so that may be something that you all would have to assist them with okay. Beth do we have any questions not at this time okay um like I said give as many details and specifics as you can but Make sure you're reporting it as you were told or as you've seen it. Um, don't, don't assume and don't add your own details. Um, if you think that's really not how that probably happened, well, you can think that, but you, re you need to report it the way it was reported to you. And that would be by the child when you're saying- By the child, right, right. And it's okay to say, I don't know or I'm unaware because sometimes when I make hotlines, I have very little information. And so I will say, I don't know the answer to that. And it's okay. They, we can either find the information and call the local children's division office, or that's a lot of times when you will get a call back if those questions are, I don't know. Um, but it, that is okay. I would rather you say, I don't know, or I'm aware, than make something up and report, make a false report. Um, you, after you make the hotline call, you need to document your findings, what you saw, what child said to you, the time and date you called in the hotline, the person that you talked to. They will give you their name and they will also give you their worker ID number. So you need to report all, document all of that on your report um, for your documentation. And so if it's ever said, well, that wasn't called in, you have that information. Natalie, this is Beth. When you make an online report, do you receive any information back from that? To record you do. that? I, yes, actually, I was getting ready to say that. I'm um, sorry. You actually, no, you're good. It's fine. Um, you actually get an email saying that you submitted a hotline. And then, so I print that out. I print that out as my copy and it will tell you if it was taken um, and referred to the local office or if it was just taken as what they call a P referral is just like an informational purposes report. Um, so it will tell you that on that, on that email that you get. So, um, so you can, that you can print that out. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And something else I'm going to add, Children's Division, um, when you're hotline, when you call in a hotline, it can be coded different things and they have so many hours to respond to certain types of hotlines. So if it's imminent danger, um, like a meth lab or a child is being sexually abused right now, or, you know, you think they will be sexually abused in the next 24 hours, they only have like three to five hours to respond to that. Um, other reports come in, they have 24 hours to respond. So, um, <clears throat> but even if your hotline is not taken, it is still documented and it is still in the system. And I get frustrated when my hotlines aren't taken because I'm like, why was that not taken? You know, I know, I know, I know, I know something's going on with that child. Just because it's not taken doesn't mean it's not in there, it is. And so when we get to the point of needing to remove a child from that home, that history comes into play because we can print that out, Children's Division prints that out, provides it to the juvenile office, and we are the ones that actually petition the courts and have the authority to remove children from the home. 
um, we use that in our cases. We can say, this was reported four times, and it was the fifth time that it was actually investigated. There is this, there is history here, there is a pattern here, and we can show that, and it actually strengthens our case. So even you think, oh, they're not gonna take it. Call it in anyway. It only helps us protect those kids. Natalie, this is Beth. I would agree with that. I was actually gonna jump in and say the same thing. Prior to working at Extension, I worked at the Children's Division for seven years, and I worked with a chronic neglect case. And they only had um, probably five or six things that were investigated, but they had over 100 different hotlines of children not in car seats or um, running around on the street, you know, like a two-year-old unsupervised. Stuff like that is really documented, and it really goes to prove on cases like chronic neglect. Yes, because those are some of the hardest ones to prove for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, remain professional after you've made that hotline. And like I said, I get frustrated when my hotline's not taken. Um, but only tell who needs to know. Um, and um, as we all are professionals, and juvenile stuff is confidential, juvenile cases, juvenile information. Once it goes to Children's Division or once it goes to uh, juvenile authorities, it is confidential. So I would think that you only, your volunteers and staff only need to tell people that it's pertinent to you. You don't need to tell everybody that you called in that hotline or that your volunteer called in that hotline. Um, so we need to be careful who we're disclosing some of this information to. And it also comes back to keep you know, your safety um, because around here, everybody knows everybody. So if they know I called in a hotline, they're liable to go tell that family, well, Natalie called in that hotline for you. Well, what does that do? That puts me and my family at risk. So um, mandated reporters, we have the right to know the, um, the outcome of a hotline. And you will be notified usually by letter um, on how once the Children's Division investigates it and they have 45 days to investigate a hotline and um, so we all think well once it goes in they're going to investigate it and they're going to get it done really really fast. No not so much. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into that. I mean Beth can probably elaborate but they they make collateral contacts. They go meet with the family. They meet with the kids. They meet with the school. They meet with other you know, family members, I mean, they try, they do a thorough investigation before they conclude that hotline because their job is to ensure safety of that child. So if they can't ensure safety, then that is sent to me and then we petition the court to remove that child. So um, they have to get, get all the information they can before they decide that doesn't meet the criteria to be substantiated or uh, preponderance of evidence. Because if you have a hotline that is preponderance of evidence and substantiated, that goes on that parent's record and stays there. Um, I had a lady that beat her child with a fireplace poker and she was in nursing school. Well, we proved our case. Um, she even had criminal charges and was found guilty. She was kicked out of nursing school because she had a history of child abuse and neglect. So that's kind of how some of this goes into play with, with when those reports go in. Um, in 45 days, you should receive a letter telling you how that, um, and now it won't give you all the details. It will just tell you it was found preponderance of evidence, it was substantiated or unsubstantiated. They, that's all the information that you will get. And even if you call, they can't elaborate very much more than that without um, breaking the confidentiality rules of Children's Division. Um, if at any time yourself or somebody else feels like Children's Division, um, you weren't satisfied with the results or you know children are in foster care and you're not satisfied with anybody that's working that case, there is an office that you can call and that's a child advocate office. And they are completely um, separate office from in any of us um, and they will actually investigate those cases they come down sometimes I look at our cases sometimes they just send us a letter requesting information um, we've had multiple cases that's been investigated and um, 
fine. I, I, it doesn't bother me because I know in my cases I'm doing doing them the right way. Um, so I don't have a problem, you know, with somebody else looking at my case. Um, we get this call a lot of times on grandparents that aren't happy because we, children's division didn't place with grandparents or they think that we've done something wrong when by standards of children's division, the grandparents can't have that child for whatever reason. But that's a lot of times it's a family member that's not happy that calls and reports us. There is my contact information, um, my phone number and my email. Feel free to keep that. Um, you can call me, you can email me, any questions at any time. Um, it, it does not bother me one bit. Um, my kids go to the Boys and Girls Club and it's usually about a couple times a month they want to ask me a question if I think they should hotline or hey, this is going on, what do you think? It doesn't bother me to be called and asked that. If we're keeping a child safe, that's what's important to me. Okay. Any other questions or comments or? Thank you, Natalie, very much. Yeah, definitely. There is some, open it. Um, I'm sorry, there's one thing I wanted to add. I want to, um, when you make a hotline on, if you have a child on child, um, I have a case where a brother has been um, having sex with his sister for about seven years. Um, when that went in as a hotline, he was the perpetrator. So it is done the exact same way. So even if you have a juvenile perpetrator, you hotline it the exact same way as you would an adult. And the investigation works the exact same way, except for um, the Sheriff's Department co-investigates with Children's Division on adults perping on children. The juvenile office and the sheriff's departments work together on juvenile on juvenile cases. So, great. Well, definitely, it is time to uh, open up the Zoom for questions, and our expert panels will hang around and and answer questions. I've just popped in another resource uh, on mandated reporting involving elderly and disabled. Uh, and I'll, I'll repost the other links in the chat pod of the other resources that are out there. This is all great information, uh, definitely things that we need to know. And, and by knowing these things, then we can communicate the, the need to our volunteer groups a lot more effectively. Oh, by the way, a copy of this PowerPoint will be made available to everyone um, who attended as another resource. Hey, Eric. Yes. This is Justin K. I have a question, um, not so much related to abuse, but maybe best practices or expectations when it comes to like mental health and uh, depression or, you know, mentions of suicide and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. from a from a volunteer or a participant well you know i guess my, for myself you know working with um master gardeners and master naturalists and you know things like that um, what would be my you know role and responsibility or expectation if if i had you know one of my volunteers that was expressing some of that stuff are you talking like an adult volunteer or a child? It would, mo in my case, it would be an adult volunteer. Uh, definitely, I think um, I'm trying to pull up uh, a site now, but definitely if a uh, suicide prevention hotline of some mm -hmm. kind, definitely should be uh, called in. All those, all those things when people mention things like that. Yeah, to hear on the side of being too safe than, than the other. I'm sorry, Eric, you were cutting out for the last half of your statement there. Oh, I was saying, you know, just basically better to be safe than, than not reporting. So um, I will elaborate on that a little bit because it's um, juvenile stuff is handled a little bit differently, but 
there is always a crisis number that you can call regarding um, mental health and things like that. At the, usually your local hospital has a crisis or your um, like down here, it's behavioral health care is tied with our hospital in Springfield. There's Burl. Um, and actually, you can also go through the emergency, they can go through the emergency room and the emergency room will assist them with either putting them in um, their facility, their psychiatric ward or finding a location for them to go. So if you can get them to the emergency room or call that crisis hotline, that would be the best. So like just throwing out this like worst case scenario, say like, you know, somebody in one of my trainings says, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about suicide, you know, do I need to call the police department? Do I need to just encourage them to go to an emergency room? I think you can either, you can do either or, or both. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, I have a question for you too. I, okay. And then Natalie, I'm sure you will um, interject some information. Um, as she was talking about the perpetrator of abuse, it could be physical, it could be sexual abuse, being a sibling, um, how does that impact our camp counselors? Right, and right. the reason I'm asking that is because we obviously put counselors that are still teens themselves in charge of youth. And um, some of the facilities we use, there will be two counselors within a cabin with, you know, younger campers. How do we, do we um, should we begin as maybe a new policy screening those counselors? Natalie, can we even get that information through a background check on them? If it's a juvenile? Yeah. Eric? Because hmm. I, I mean, guess. we, hmm. you know, we're That's trusting right. the counselors that we right. have that they are. Um, hmm using best behaviors and you know we don't team them where there's a counselor by themselves we always team them where there's more than one but i guess maybe i'm overthinking well, uh, no. beth, beth what Go do you ahead, think yeah. i think i just sent out a chat that i wasn't supposed to hit send on yet because i was trying to get to the mic um in my experience um, you're not allowed to have um juvenile records. But Natalie, right. that might have changed. Several of the things you introduced today has changed in the 14 years that I work there. Um, but you might want to also consider if we can't have access to that, if you do have, and this isn't going to be fail, fail proof at all. Um, but typically the club leader might know of a more trusting or not trusting situation and have letters of support mm -hmm. for them. Okay. from a club leader or from another parent or something. Um, and that's not going to be an end all be all to our question, right. but it also provides more than just an application from a child and their parent. Right. right. And there, there's one other safeguard that's um, highly, highly, highly recommended. Although I've, I've been on the camp side of things and I know it's also very, very, very difficult to do. And that is to have, uh, you know, a recognized adult volunteer in the cabin, at least one, maybe two, so that there is somebody who is uh, a certified screened adult who is in the room with the teen counselors, with the young campers. We, we had, did have a situation come up where a camper talked to a counselor and had some pretty, you know, serious things going on. And what happened there, you know, who's the mandated reporter? Well, the counselor got with the specialist and kind of talked through the situation, I believe together, or at least, you know, the specialist took the lead in reporting in, in that instance. Mm -hmm. Well, to answer, to agree with Beth and then add some more information to that, um, you know, juvenile records are confidential. And since Children's Division does not investigate juvenile on juvenile, so hotlines where the juvenile is the perpetrator, we do, and sheriff's departments, 
they may not have any information to release to you anyway, nor can they. Um, okay. We have juveniles that, because we use the same charge codes as adults, um, and we use the word adjudicated instead of guilty. So we have a kid that has been found guilty of child molestation. Well, he has to register as a sex offender, as a juvenile. So he is registering in our office in a three ring binder. That's our registry. Um, and he has to register until he's 21. Well, we can't release that information to you. The only information that you would be able to get on a juvenile is if they were certified and then that information, then they had to register as an adult. Okay. I know that was a probably not what you wanted and that was a lot of information. But. No, I, it, it's just gonna make me ask maybe more questions about camp. <laughs> well, and I don't think that if you even ask, the way you ask, I mean, obviously parents don't want to say, oh yeah, my child, you know, yeah, right, uh, did right. such and such to their sibling and so now they're a registered sex offender on their juvenile registry. They're not gonna come forward with that information. Right. This, this is Becky. I actually had a parent tell me they wouldn't send their kid to camp just because there is no way to check that. And I can understand that. I mean, yeah. you don't want to anymore. It's, and working and doing what I do day in and day out. I mean, my child, had, my children have only stayed the night at like, to friend's house. And even when they got home, I'm like, well, who else was there? What did you guys do? Where did you sleep? Um, and so I, I, I get that. I get that mentality. Yeah. I am not seeing any. I got one. Uh, definitely, you know, keep them coming. You can send them my way. I have recorded this session, so I definitely will share that out as well. I'm not hearing or seeing any questions. Definitely want to thank our panel of experts, and this is the format I hope to continue going forward. Again, coming up in October, I, I'm planning to have one on Garden and Grow, uh, a program that is great probably for both the 4-H uh, specialists as well as those folks that work with master gardeners and I'm open to ideas if you've got a, a topic or a project or a program that you think other people should know about then especially around the area of volunteer development let me know and I will surely find a place for you to tell the world about. Justin did you say you had a question yeah, I'm sorry. I came in a couple minutes late, so you all might have covered this, but um, so I'm working with all adult volunteers, but sometimes they do activities where there are children there. So, you know, if it's an activity where my volunteers are running an event <clears throat> and there's children and the children's parents are there um, versus the children's parents are not there, does that impact how one of those volunteers might be a mandated reporter? Natalie. Yeah, I'm, so the children are there and their parents bring them or they don't bring them. Well, I guess I was just wondering how either scenario would, would uh, change whether or not it's a mandated reporter. I mean, a lot of times if there is an event that the volunteers put on, um, you know, if there's kids, the parents are there, but I mean, there might be some circumstances where, you know, the parents drop them off and are not there. Uh -huh. I don't think it changes. I mean, if you've got a child that's being abused, you have to, even in my, I'm not on the clock and I see a child that's being abused out in public or at a sporting event that I'm at that I know, then I have to report it. I don't know if that's the same, if that's what you're saying or. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's fine. That clears it up. Thank you. Yep. I, I think the gist of the message today would be to err on the side of the child. 
So if you think something's going on, make the call as opposed right. to putting the hat on that, oh, it's not my job today. Yes, and I will say this because in my office there has been multiple discussions about this and I there's different opinions about this and when I go to training it's been brought up. So using the example I just gave Justin, when I, most of the time I work eight to five. So at seven o'clock, I'm at a football game. I'm now mom. I'm not juvenile officer because I'm not on call to that tonight. And I'm, uh, I'm just a mom in the stands. However, I'm still a mandated reporter. I still have to give my name. Some people think, no, you're not. You are now mom, you aren't juvenile officer. I see that differently. I think once you're a mandated reporter, you're always a mandated reporter. You can't pick and choose when you are or when you're not. And so you would still have to give, I guess saying that you would still have to give your name when you call it in. You can't remain anonymous. And you're still liable, um, in my opinion, if you don't call something in and you know about it, whether you're, whether you're working, quote, quote, or not, in my opinion, you could still be held liable. All right, I don't see any in the chat. Um, Eric had to step away, he had another meeting to go to. So I'm gonna close this out here. I really appreciate Natalie joining us today. Um, my experience with the Children's Division was long ago, and mm -hmm. this is her area of expertise, and I greatly value you joining us and letting us know the training you share with other people. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you, Belinda for sharing yeah. your expertise and connecting us to a wonderful presenter today. Um, in the chat, you guys will find a survey. Eric is um, very good about reading these and following up with us and really making sure that what he's providing is relevant to our work. So everyone, if you could take the time to finish the chat or to look in your chat and see the survey, that would be wonderful. And um, Natalie shared her information with us. You have Eric's information for further questions. Is there anything else before we sign off for the day? All right, seeing none. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for Natalie. having me and everything. I appreciate it. Thank you, Natalie. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Thanks, Beth. All right, everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks, bye-bye.